Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hoag, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. I'm AJ Hoag, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. You must join my VIP program. You will get the Red Pill Movie course as a bonus for free. But you've got to join. You've got to commit now. Commit and don't quit to my VIP program. Also, Business English Conversations. Watch your email. I'll send another email tonight with more information about my Business English course. Watch your email. Today we're going to talk about um, actually an idea I just recently had and I just thought I would share it with you because I think it's interesting and you know I thought maybe even it could be useful for us for uh, language but especially just in your personal life in your family life so we'll talk about it. We're live on YouTube, of course. Just going to wait a couple minutes, let people join. A few more people join in live, and then we will get started. So the title today, Family Heritage Conversations. Family Heritage Conversations. All right, let's get started, shall we? One of the problems in our age, our modern age, is that you know families are being attacked. Right? We know this. We learn this in Brave New World. It's not an accident. Uh, in the United States, I would say it was my parents' generation that really um, destroyed the family. They're the ones who went crazy getting divorces and having not... They didn't have many children and really they... They broke the chain, I would call it. Uh, you know, there's kind of a chain. If we look back of our ancestors going back, 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 generations, generations, generations. And each generation, it's your duty. It's our duty. It's each generation's duty to preserve, to protect and preserve what came before, right? Because in many ways, our ancestors, right, those who come before us, they give us all that we have. Right? All that is around us, uh, the civilization we have, this very easy, comfortable, safe civilization that we have is because of them. We didn't do it. I didn't build it. You didn't build it. They built it. Our ancestors built it over ge many generations of time. And you know they're the ones who've given us so much wisdom. We owe so much to them. And at the least, we owe them the love and the respect to protect what they built and to preserve it and maybe add to it and then give it to our children and our grandchildren, our descendants, those who come after us, right? This is our basic duty. And I would say, I'm only talking about the United States. I don't know about other countries, but uh, unfortunately, in the United States, my parents' generation, they broke this promise. They failed their duty. They did not protect what came before. They rejected it foolishly. They rejected, mostly they rejected God and religion. They rejected family. Uh, they, they were fools, selfish fools. But... That it is what it is. So what can we do? Well, my generation and the generations coming after me, we have to rebuild. We have to somehow uh, go back and find out, you know, what, like in my case, like what my grandparents had, what my great grandparents had, and that heritage, that tradition, uh, all those wonderful things that came to us from the past. And we have to rebuild them in some cases and protect them. And the big ones of course, one of the biggest ones is family, family, right? Everything, if we look at our ancestors, they will tell you, don't talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents. 
if you your great grandparents probably not alive, but if they were, I'm sure they would tell you family, 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 how important family. Family is the foundation of society, the foundation of a nation. Without the families, then everything falls apart. Which is why, of course, the uh, you know the the world controllers, the bankers, the the globalists, whatever you want to call them, that's why they attack the family, and they have attacked the family so much. So I'm thinking about this, walking around as I often do, <laughs> thinking about this, and thinking about, of course, now I'm a father and I have children, and I'm not going to do what uh, my parents' generation did. Uh, I feel a very strong responsibility to my children that I must pass on this and that I must uh, create a very strong family for them and teach them how to create a strong family uh, themselves and that I need to give my children a very strong connection to the past, right? Because they need that. It, it gives us roots. We need that. We need this connection to our ancestors, to our past, to our traditions, I didn't have that growing up. All of that was lost. All of that was lost. My parents taught me none of that. None of it. I had none of it. And I, and I always felt that it was something missing. And I kind of gradually, uh, be, thanks to one of my grandmothers, uh, I have kind of refound that. One of my grandmothers wrote a family history. She did a lot of research. Uh, and my grandfather, but especially my grandmother. And they traveled around uh, the United States and looking at records and looking at grave sites where uh, their ancestors were buried and doing lots of research. And they wrote this whole big history of my father's family, so the Hogue family, going back uh, almost a thousand years, all the way back to Scotland. So this big family tree, I very much appreciate it. It, it gives me a feeling of having a connection, roots connected to my ancestors. And so I started thinking about this myself, and of course I have that, and I'm going to, I think that's something beautiful that my grandmother has left. She's 100 years old, she's still alive, uh, and I think, well, what's, what's my duty? My duty, of, of course, is to preserve that and to give it to my children and teach them about it, but also to add to it. You know, I realized that, well, I need to contribute myself, and this is where I started thinking, like, how can I contribute to this? How can I... Uh, make this heritage, this connection to our ancestors, uh, to our family, stronger, stronger for my children. And this is where I got the idea. I thought, well, you know what I can do is I can start to gather, I can add to this family history. Right now, it's just a kind of basic outline of history. Lots of names going back, you know, all my ancestors back to Scotland uh, over a thousand years ago which is great, but there's not a lot of detail in there. Like, there are a lot of names, but I don't know who these people are, mostly. And so what I've decided to do, I'm going to start recording interviews with my uh, family. With my, so right now, I, I'm very lucky. I still have two of my grandparents. My two, my, both my grandmothers are alive. The one grandmother is 100 years old this year. The other grandmother's 95. So... You know, they're, they're at the end of their lives, for sure. But because they are still alive, uh, I still have a chance, you know, God willing, that the next time I go back to the United States, if they're both <laughs> alive, I'm going to have a, get a video camera and I'm going to interview them and ask them, what am I going to interview them about? Their lives. I wanna, I'm going to try to get them to tell stories about their lives. What were their lives? What were their childhoods like? Tell Talk about their childhoods. What was it like? What were their parents like? Right? My great-grandparents. I never met my... Well, I met one great-grandmother. I only have a very... Not much of a memory of her, but no memory of the others. So get my grandmothers to tell stories about their parents and their grandparents. And what was their childhood like? And, and then talk about their lives and what were the most important events in their lives, the big events in their lives. What did they learn? And what lessons did they want to share about what's important in life for everyone who, who's younger than them, who comes after them in the family? And uh, so I'll do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to interview them. I might need to edit it a little because uh, at least one of my grandmothers, she kind of repeats herself 
a lot. She tells the same exact story many times. But uh, so anyway, I'll just record it. If she repeats too much, I can edit a little bit. Then I'm going to transcribe it. So put it into writing. And the writing part, I'm going to create my idea is to create like a, a book, basically a book of stories from our family told by our ancestors, my grandparents. I'm going to do the same with my parents. So my father and my mother and my wife's. We're also going to do it on my wife's side. So she has two grandparents who are both alive, uh, a, a grandfather and a grandmother they're who are married, and they're both in their 90s. We're going to interview them, and, uh, and then we'll interview my wife's parents. And then, of course, eventually we'll get to my generation, and uh, I'll do the same. I'll, I'll get in front of a camera. I'll tell stories about my own life growing up and as an adult, and what did I, what have I learned, and what do I want to share with my kids and my grandkids and my great, great, great grandkids who I'll never meet. <laughs> and uh, I'll do the same. We'll do this with my wife. I'll do it with my sister. Uh, my wife can do it. With, she has two sisters. So building up, you know, with all of these relatives in our family, we can build up quite a huge amount of family stories and family history. Uh, living. And like I said, I'll get it transcribed. So there'll be a written part and I'm going to make it into kind of a, like a book. But then also, of course, save the video files and organize the video files so that my children, as they grow up, they can see, they can watch a video. They can watch the interview of my grandmother. They may never, they'll probably never remember my grandmother who's a hundred years old, but they can, uh, watch the video of her and listen to her stories on the video and the interview and of course read about her stories and in this way have still a connection to her and to that history in our family and do the same with my other grandmother and do the same with my wife's side and then my hope is of course that that my children might continue this for their own children so they can add their own stories later on and in this way it can become kind of a living history of our family going forward this is my big idea we'll see it's going to take many years to put together. Uh, the first thing I, though, that I realize I must do is record those interviews with my grandparents because they're so old, and my wife's grandparents, they're both, uh, they're all old, they're all in their 90s, so we've got to do it now. We've got to do it now. And I th started thinking about this and how, you know, this is really can bring to life the family history, this connection to the past that is, has been destroyed in the United States that has been is being destroyed in so many places, so many people losing that connection to their ancestors. And we can rebuild that. And that's something that I hope that I can do and that the generations after me, my children and grandchildren, will also do. So finally, I decided, well, that's a cool idea. I'm going to do it. But I should share this with you all in the show because... Um, why not? You know, maybe you all could do the same. This is it's a, it's an opportunity that I think is something we should all do. A lot of people have lost that connection family. There's so many divorces now and all, all this it's a mess. It's a disaster. So we've got to rebuild. Okay? We've got to got to take this back. We got to take back our families and and rebuild all those connections. And I think this is a great way to do it. It's a uh, honors and respects our ancestors and it also honors and respects our children and grandchildren our descendants because we're doing it for them so that's what i recommend so uh, what i propose is that you also do this that we all do this start interviewing people in your family and i would say start with the oldest generations that are alive if you have grandparents that are alive still that's fantastic interview them now while you can Maybe you don't. Maybe they, they've already passed away. Well, then hopefully you're, you have a parent or parents alive. Do that. If your parents have passed away, maybe you have an uncle or uncles or aunts, you know, from that older generation. Interview them. And even if they have passed away, you can then do it yourself. You know, not interview yourself, but think about it. Write down, you know, kind of the story of your life. Think of, think of like the, the, the best memories you have of your own childhood, the strongest memories you have of your childhood growing up and, and, and of your own parents and grandparents. And then, of course, your life up till now. And uh, pick out the most important stories, the ones you think might be interesting or entertaining even or valuable to your children, your grandchildren, your descendants. 
and start to record those yourself now. I highly recommend you do this. Now, here's the language part. You're thinking, what does this have to do with language? Well, so if some of these are very personal, then keep them private. They're only for your family. That's fine. But some of them might be not so private. You, know, it's, you don't care. They, your relatives don't mind if other people hear them. So what, what I propose is that at least some of these interviews, some of these stories, we could share to help with language learning. Now, where will we do this? Not Effortless English is not... Everest English is only English, so maybe I'll share mine with some of you from my family. I, I could maybe do that. Uh, maybe I'll even do a whole new course, <laughs> you know, like family conversations or something. That would be kind of cool, actually. Uh, and you could hear like my grandparents and my parents and my uncles and aunts and cousins and nephews and, you know, like all these people to speaking English and talking about all these stories. I think that'd be kind of cool. Maybe we'll do that. But what you could also do if you just want to help other people learn your language, we could use Link because, uh, you know, our, our friend Steve Kaufman over at Link, he has asked for this. He has mentioned many times how he would love to have conversations in many different languages to help people learn languages. So, for example, if you are Iranian and uh, you could interview your family, and you know, of course, in Persian and Farsi, and then, uh, you know, the some of the stories that are not too private you could put them on link share them on link with the transcripts and now people can use those to improve to learn farsi and at the same time you're kind of sharing some of your family stories i think it would be super interesting for most people this is real stuff very very fascinating i would love this in japanese and and i'm looking forward to of course when we interview when we interview my wife's family, the, the, the interviews will be in Japanese. I'll get them translated into English, but um, uh, I will use the interviews and the stories uh, for my own Japanese learning. So, and, and so much more interesting than any other, than any just some book or manga or something or, or anime, I think, for me at least, uh, these real family stories. Like, for example, my, my wife's grandfather is he's super interesting guy. He lived through World War II uh, and uh, a very, 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 very hard times in Japan at that time, especially right at the end of the war. You know, people are starving. He, uh, his father had like a lot of wives, like, so they, they kept dying. And <laughs> anyway, he's got this very fascinating, interesting uh, story with a lot, you know, a lot of great stuff, a lot of very tough experiences. Um, I would love to to listen to those and use those for my own Japanese learning. So you could do that if you, um, if you know, if you you speak Spanish, your relatives speak Spanish. So you could interview, you know, interview your grandparents, your parents, your brothers, sisters, whatever, and uh, get their get their life stories. It would be great for your family. You could organize them yourself, and then some of them share them on link l i n g q dot com. If you have the audio and the transcripts, share them on link and then other people who are learning Spanish, like me, uh, could use them uh, and learn about these great stories, real life stories from the past, from your own family history. So this is what I propose. And uh, you know, if you're interested, please do it. And if you do it in Japanese or if you do it in Spanish, please share link on Gab. Tell me, right? Tell me on Gab because I'll, I'll use your families, uh, interviews, or stories myself. If Those are the two languages I'm learning. So uh, if it's either of those two, please tell me on Gab. You can still share on Gab with other languages. Maybe other people are learning your language. Okay, let's get into some comments and questions and see what we got here. All right. Erdem says, what if our families do not care and do not pay attention to support some success? Where can we get the power to feel successful? Well, you know what? Interview them anyway. Doesn't matter. So, you know, here's this is real history, guys. So find the truth. And maybe... I mean, I can think of a few <laughs> on my, uh, my family. There, there might be some people and some stories in your family that are not great. 
but it's still the it's still real, it's still the truth. So uh, I, for one, I want to know that it's part of my history. It's part of my family's history. Those are still my ancestors. So even maybe maybe there was somebody in your family who was just a horrible bastard, who was an alcoholic, who was a jerk, who was a thief, who was a criminal. So, I mean, if they're alive, interview them anyway. Interview them anyway. <laughs> Why not? It's real. It's truth. Find the truth. It's not about creating a lie. It's about the truth. And there might be parts of your family history that are ugly, but even that we can learn from, right? We can learn from that and say, well, oh, but got to be careful, <laughs> right? Like some families have a lot of alcoholics in their, in their history, right? Because there is a genetic part. There is something genetic, physical. Um, there's a component part of alcoholism and drug addiction. Uh, there is a physical aspect to it. We can see it. There's also psychological parts, of course, spiritual aspects. But there's definitely a genetic component part where you can see that in some families, like I have a friend, and uh, this friend's family has a lot of alcoholism on one side. On one side of the family, you just see alcoholics, alcoholics, an uncle, uh, you know, a couple uncles, cousins. Just there's so there's a lot of alcoholics, right? And they come from they have different life situations. So it's not they're not poor. They're not it, there's something physical like that. They just it's easier for them to become addicted to, to alcohol. And uh, this is true. So that's something good to know about your family. It would be great, something important for your children to know because it could be a warning. You could say, look, our family has a kind of weakness for alcohol. So be very careful about drinking. Maybe you should not drink, okay? Other families, it doesn't matter, right? My, my family, there's no alcoholism in my family, either side, right? Qu quite the opposite. <laughs> they don't drink. My mom's side of the family, like almost nobody drinks at all. Um, even my dad's side, not much. So, uh, you know, it's kind of the opposite. We don't feel like I, if I drink alcohol, I, I feel my stomach feels bad immediately. It's kind of like the opposite of alcoholism, whatever that is. <laughs> okay. But it, even if it, if, but if your family had that history, that's good to know because it's a warning. You, you might save some of your children or grandchildren some pain when they realize, okay, we have to be careful. In our family, there's this kind of danger in our family history that you can see. And, uh, you know, maybe if you, we can even interview some of those people, they might even, in their story, they might warn you, don't drink. Our family, we shouldn't drink. Right? Or maybe your family's bad with money or whatever it is, right? There's, there's, you can, uh, we, you can learn things from even the, the tough stuff. Hey, Vladislav, good to see you. Okay, I'm just catching up. I'm kind of going back to the beginning here. Okay. Uh, Wins asked me, what do you know about, what do you think about how Aristotle's view of the family? I, I don't know Aristotle's view of the family, so I'd have to, you know, point me to a link uh, of what he said about it, and then I'll, I can comment. <laughs> I haven't read everything Aristotle has written. Uh, Vladislav says, what about your grandfathers? Unfortunately, they're not alive. Um, they lived into their 70s. So like the grandmothers, in my, in my family, the grandmothers have lived a very long time. My grandfather is about average. Um, I wish, you know, I've, of course, now I wish that I had done this with my grandfathers. Very much so. But it's too late. So I'm saying, you know, don't wait till it's too late. Yeah, there you go. Ibrahim Ali says, When I was a child, I loved to spend most of my free time with my grandparents more than my parents. That's not surprising in some ways. And your, if your grandparents are alive, don't miss the opportunity to learn from them. That's priceless. Indeed. Well, you know, grandparents have a nice role in, in most families because, um, you know, parents, you have a lot of responsibility. You love your children, but you also have to, you have to discipline them. You have to, you know, right there. You kind of have to be tough with them sometimes, but grandparents can kind of spoil the kid, the 
kids a little more, the grandkids, they don't have that same responsibility. They can kind of relax, right? And, and it's kind of common. It's very common for someone like, let's say, this, your parents maybe were very tough to you, but then when you have children, they're very, very soft with your, with your children, with your grandkids. And you're like, hey, what, what's the deal? You were so tough with me and you're so nice to them. But that's why. Because they, as grandparents, they can just do all the fun stuff and they don't need to be so responsible. It's an important role. Kids need that, ideally. Irina says, I've got a question. My little brother goes to school. He can't explain anything. He wants to be fluent in English. He doesn't know how to learn English without grammar. Well, teach him, uh, you know, get my book. Maybe that's probably the best. You know, all the information's in one place. Get my book and teach him the seven rules and uh, get him started on the mini stories. That's all he's got to do. Ah, Vladislav says, uh, today I saw a video of a Russian guy in America. He said, Americans tend to kick their children out of the homes when they turn 18. Yes, that's true. Like they pay rent or they live in the house. People value money more than family. Yes. Now, see, this comes from a history of the U.S. being this kind of frontier society, right? Where there's this... People were going west, and there was this uh, very strong focus on self-reliance, that you had to be strong, you had to be able to take care of yourself, uh, because it was a hard environment in a new world with lots of opportunities. And so that's where this comes from. But things are different now. We're not a frontier society anymore uh, economically. It's very, very tough now for young people. So uh, this is a case where maybe... This was a nice idea in the past. Uh, it created quite a strong people, and but now the situation is different, and it doesn't quite work as well. Um, yeah. But to see, the problem is you also have an opposite problem, in where you have kids who never grow up, <laughs> uh, who will stay living at their parents' house. You know, just too long they never go out they never take a risk they just stay they're still acting like children when they're 20 22 25 28 and maybe they need to be kicked out so it's it's hard to say it, you have to look at the situations individually but it, it's absolutely that's part of american culture i would say traditionally although somewhat different now Hey, Lisa has joined us live. Good. I'm glad you could join live. I finally got to do a little later today. And Slavika is here too. Great. Yeah, a lot of people agreeing, like Jamal says, uh, it's a great idea. There's so many things to be learned from our family's histories. Indeed, indeed. I think more than, I think it's real, right? When you read a story of like history books, first of all, there's a lot of bullshit in there. <laughs> okay. A lot of lies, a lot of propaganda from the government and others. So when you're reading a story about whatever, the history of your country, it's hard to know how much is true and how much is false. You've got to dig in there and find it. But And it's also, though, the other problem is it's about strangers. It's about people, you know, these that are, that are not directly connected to your family. But your grandparents or your great-grandparents, those are real people. I mean, those are, you know, connected by, by uh, very strong connections. So when you're, those stories are intimate we say right they're very very close very 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 meaningful more meaningful i think than the big historical uh figures that we learn about i think it's a more important history i think your family history is more important than your country's history 
or world history. You know, they both have some importance, but the family history is more important. It's the foundation. Oh, this is cool. In says, it's a very interesting idea. My sister has written the story of our family and neighbors. I can translate some of them for you. For privacy, she has changed the names. There you go. That's something else you could do. You could change names if you want to share it with other people. That's wonderful. You should put it on link. Put it on link. Uh, I mean, a translation would be cool. I, I could read the English translation. That'd be great. But you could also put the Farsi on there uh, on link for people learning Farsi, Persian. Uh, let's see, Ming Ma says, Nowadays, what is the children's responsibility to ask about family heritage? Or do we need a responsibility to convince them? Teach them. It's the responsibility of the parents to teach them. Right? Because the children won't ask necessarily. They might not ask. They might not think to ask, especially when they're young. So it's our responsibility. Like I said, this is where my parents' generation really failed. <laughs> Big failure. Um so well, but I'm going to learn from their failure, and I'm not. I I will teach my children these stories, and uh, and of course share. If I have video, I'll share that with them. Uh, we'll read about it because I'll be homeschooling, so I'll use these uh, the text for as part of our homeschooling. So they'll learn as part of their education. They're going to learn about their family. They're on both sides, mom's and dad's family. So I think it is mostly the parents' responsibility, and grandparents too. Yeah, this is very nice. So Brahim has a nice experience. Our parents gave us life in this wonderful planet Earth, loving others and human values. I lived with my parents and my grandparents. I feel there are two holes of protection. That's very nice. See, this is also a tradition. Uh, like if, if you go back and look. So again, like in America, the, they're called the baby boomers, my parents' generation. They, again, they broke this tradition. But before them, my grandparents... And, and before, they had many generations in the, same, in the family, in the house, right? So you would have the grandparents, maybe one or both grandparents uh, living in the house, plus the parents living in the house, right? And plus the children. So you, you, it was very common to have three generations under one roof in the same house, and, uh, which is really, really, really good for the kids, and the family as a whole, um, and and this that was normal. I think in I think in a lot of countries, that is, maybe still is normal, but certainly was normal for for most of human history. Yeah, like Slavika says, my grandma was my first and best life coach. Of course, in childhood, I spend most of my time with her. Very nice. Very nice. Grand grandparents can have really a wonderful effect, a wonderful connection with their grandkids. Yeah, so very great. Marjan, my grand grandfather was in World War II. I remember his stories when I was a child. I love listening to him, even though I knew back then that he was exaggerating. Yeah, I wish I had them recorded. Yeah, except that, you know, sometimes to make a story good, you exaggerate. <laughs> Some people do that, and, you know, that's okay. I just watched a movie kind of about that exact topic. Khalil says, sometimes it's tough to communicate with old people. Yeah, it depends. If you just, just ask them questions and listen more. I think anyone tries to respect them, don't be rude when you talk to them. Yep. Depends on the individuals. Ponka says, sometimes children and parents are not emotionally close to have a meaningful conversation, um, let alone interviewing them. Ah, oh, well, the interviewing, this might be a chance, actually. You got to try to understand. See, the problem is you got to, I think what happens a lot is that we have to try, remember the, 
you know, the lesson from um, the, what is it called? Seven Habits, right? You got to try to understand them first. Too often, like you're trying to be understood. You want them to understand you. So you're trying to talk and they want you to understand them. So uh, both trying to talk, talk, talk. And instead, you just try to understand them first. Don't worry about them understanding you. Uh, I think it works. One person has to step up and do that and be the leader in that way. Yeah, right. Now, see, like Vladislav with the point of this is when it can go too long. My 45-year-old uncle still lives with my grandparents. He's an alcoholic. That's why he's unsuccessful. But his mom loves him and doesn't want him to leave. He had family with a daughter, but then divorced. Right. And I see, I know someone like this too, not in my family, but a friend's family. And this is where, right, that's the other side of it, where uh, he probably needed to be kicked out long, long ago because they're actually making it easier for him to be an alcoholic. Um, most alcoholics and drug addicts never change. That's the sad truth. But the ones who do change, um, it's usually because, you know, they call it hitting bottom. They hit bottom. They have to feel a huge amount of pain, right? Because they're, addic they're addicts. And as long as they can continue as addicts, they will. So the, the, the one chance they have of changing is that they lose everything. They are in so much pain that they wake up and they realize that the pain of drinking, the pain of drugs is worse than stopping, right? So, but the problem is then family members and friends don't want them to suffer so they actually help them they think they're helping they give them money they let them they give them a place to stay but what does this do it make it lets them avoid the pain so they keep on drinking and drinking longer it actually makes them it lets them keep going and this is you know this is where we say tough love in english right this is where tough love is necessary definitely with addicts and alcoholics they have to feel pain it's their only chance and still, some of them feel pain and, and they still won't change. But, I mean, you know, some of them do change, but only if they feel that huge pain. They have to lose their family. They have to lose their home. They have to lose their jobs. They have to lose basically everything. And then some of them finally wake up. So you have to let them lose everything. Let them feel the pain. They need to feel the pain. Um, so this is a case where, right, Letting them stay is probably a bad idea. They probably would have been better to kick him out. It's tough, though. I know, I, I know it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. Okay. Nice. Lisa says, I had a very early urge to leave and I went a totally different way from the rest of my family. Yeah, that happens. Uh, I'm pretty different than a lot of my family members. <laughs> My daughter's gone a step further and has reached a much higher spiritual and mental level. Yeah, we can go our own way, but still stay connected and honor them and respect them. And that's the best if you can do both. It's sometimes hard, but uh, I think overall it's best. You know, I went through a process of that myself. Right, and Vladislav is giving another example of... Uh, 50 year, of a 50-year-old son of my grandfather's, uh, he was kicked out of his family. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard, man. Uh, one of the reasons I quit being a social worker, I got sick of working with addicts. <laughs> I really got sick of it. Pretty negative about them. Yeah, Preeti says, grand people, like grandparents, are like a tree for our family. Indeed, they are, ideally, ideally, they are our strongest connection to that past and the best ones to preserve that those traditions and to pass them to their grandkids and to their children, of course. It's our duty to do this. A quite important one.
Yeah, no, see, this is a good example too. Anita says, my grandfather is not a very talkative man. For example, we've never talked about the purpose of life, etc. Only about current stuff. I'm curious about his stories and thoughts, his real personality. Right. And see, sometimes they don't talk about it. Maybe they think we're not interested. Maybe they would feel, they, they think, maybe, oh, I don't want to just, I'll bore them. They'll be bored about it. Uh, maybe they're a little shy, whatever. So that's why it's good to, to take this um, initiative, right? To go and just tell them what you're doing. Tell them why you're doing it. Say, look, I'm, I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing this for my own children. Uh, we're not going, you're not going to live forever. Neither will I. And I want to keep this alive. This is part of our family history. Your life's important. And I want to, I want to hear about it. So you just got to say this directly to them. And I, th I think most will appreciate that. I mean, I think most people would. I would. Yeah, very nice. See, right. Slavika says, my grandma was a very simple, old-fashioned woman. From her, I learned everything about good, praying about people, doing homework, preparing meals, everything. Be good with grandparents. It's a huge benefit. Right. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Hmm. Oh, Mingma is saying mostly young, young students don't follow the old ways, which means parents' beliefs and values. They've been changed by the cultural. Right. This is why you have to homeschool, guys. You, first of all, you have to... Most parents don't do this. Most parents do not make a strong effort to teach this to their children. They might talk a little, but they don't make a strong effort. They don't, they're not, they don't show leadership. So that's number one. As the parent, you have to be a strong leader. You've got to teach these things, tell these stories, not one time, but again and again and again and again and again. And also with, hopefully, with your, you know, the kids' grandparents. Number two, don't send them off to school to be programmed in a bunch of bullshit. Don't show them a bunch of Disney movies and other garbage to be programmed by a bunch of bullshit. Okay? Homeschool them. Homeschool them. <laughs> okay? Uh, so you've got you've to take these steps. You've got to do it. Too many parents, see, they, they don't do much. They send their kids to school. They let them watch all these crappy movies and all this and television. And then, uh, then the kid's 15 and starting to have problems and separating from the family. And then suddenly the parents say, oh my God, what should we do? Uh, oh, now I'm going to teach them about uh, heritage. Now I'm going to teach them about the past. Why don't they respect it? Well, it's too late. It's too late. You can't wait until they're 15 or 16. You can't wait till they're 13 or 12, honestly. You've got to start from the very beginning and continue. Don't send them off to schools. Don't let them watch all that garbage. And don't let them hang out with other kids who are like that. It's part of your job as a parent. So uh, it may not be easy, but it's what we have to do. Especially now. I'm not sure about this question, but it's kind of funny. Uh, my grandma likes working, but she's 80 years old. What can we do with her? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. What can we do with her? <coughs> A little funny. Um, let her work. You know, let her do what she wants to do. That's what I would say. She wants to work. Let her work. <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, let's see. Any, uh, next comment. Anyone can learn a lot from their elders. They have lots of experience. As the quote says, experience is a master teacher, even when it's not our own. 
Well said. That's right. We can learn. We can even learn from their mistakes, even if they're not good people. Well, we can learn from their negative examples, <laughs> okay? We can learn from their suffering. We can learn from their pain. We can learn from the bad choices they made, right? We, and then avoid all those things. So we can indeed learn a lot. We don't, they don't have to be perfect people. They don't even have to be very good people, honestly. This is kind of nice. Leek says, I've listened to a lot of stories from my grandmother, how she sang and won first place in a competition. Uh, thanks to that, I think about the stories she told me. Yeah, it's really, it's just so nice. It's so nice. It gives you a connection to the past. You realize that you are part of, of something, a family, that goes back generations and generations and generations, right? That you're not isolated. You're part of a tradition that goes back, 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 and that hopefully will continue forward, 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 forward. And that you are, you know, you're one link in that chain. Uh, what book do you recommend about homeschooling? Ah, I mean, it's a big topic, <laughs> how to do homeschooling. Uh I was going to say John Taylor Gatto, but his books are more about why to homeschool. Uh, weapons of mass instruction, dumbing us down. We did that for a book club, dumbing us down. So his books, you know, will convince you that you should do homeschooling and that it's the, don't go to school. Don't send your kids to school. But then, then the next question, of course, is how do you do homeschooling? And it's a big question because there's not one answer. There are many, 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 many ways to do homeschooling. Hundreds, thousands of ways to do homeschooling. It's one of the things I love about homeschooling, right? Public schools, even private schools around the world, they're almost all exactly the same. It's the same bullshit. It's the same approach. Everything's the same, right? And it doesn't work. It's horrible. Uh, but homeschooling is completely unique. Every family can and does do it differently to fit their family, to fit their children. So uh, I've, at some point, I'll try to do more uh, about very specific ways to do homeschooling. But those of you who are going to homeschool uh, and you're really, I know some of you get really nervous. Oh, how do I do it? That you can just buy a program or and there's some that are online. I'll try to research some and recommend a few. But um, there's one. Ron Paul has one. Okay, there's one. I can recommend that one. I like him. Ron Paul. Ron Paul Institute. R-O-N is his first name. Paul. P-A-U-L. Ron Paul Curriculum. He, uh, he has a homeschooling curriculum. You can just buy it. And then you've got all the plans. You've got all the books. You have everything you need. Just follow it. That's all you do. It's easy. That's what teachers at school do, guys. Do you think they're making all that stuff up by themselves? You think each teacher in this in a class is is so creative and they're they're making all of this by themselves? No. The school system gives them everything. They're just following it like robots mostly. Okay? You can do that. Anybody can do that. But what's better is if at home at least you can choose something better. You can choose a better curriculum that fits you, that fits your family better. You have choice. If you send your kids to school, there's no choice, right? The school decides, and they decide because based on propaganda. But if you choose the curriculum, you can decide based on your family's values, what's important to you. You can research the different ones and find one that fits. So for example, if you are Christian and you, it's very important to you for your children to have a Christian education, there are many, many, many homeschool programs from kindergarten to end of high school that are very Christian, that have Christian teaching and values in everything, in the whole curriculum. The same is true if you are Muslim, if, you, if you're not religious, if you, if you want to science something that's more heavy on science for some reason. You can find that and you can do that. This is what's cool about homeschooling is that you can you can find and just buy programs that fit what you want. Or if you're like me, 
you don't you can just create all of it yourself <laughs> okay you can just choose all oh, this book and this and this and this is what i'll do is i'll just i'll create my own plan i i'm not gonna i might buy maybe a little bit here or there or something maybe like for math i i, I want to teach math i don't i'll probably research and find a good math program and maybe do that for the kids since it's not my strong point <laughs> um but other things like reading and literature and English and uh, language and writing and even science, I can, all do, I can do myself and I'll do it the way I want. So this is, uh, I guess this is the good news and the bad news of homeschooling. It overall is very good news, but it just means that be, there's so much choice, so much flexibility that I know some people who are just starting, it's overwhelming. Like, ah, oh, what, what, how do I do it? How do I start? There's so many possibilities. Just don't get stressed about it. Okay, just choose one. Just choose one. You can always change your mind later, okay? So f try one. They're all better than school. This is the good point. Anything you choose for homeschooling will be better than the public school or better than the private school, okay? So they're all going to be better than what you would find in a school, okay? You're a better teacher than any school teacher for your own children, 100%. So don't... Don't worry about it, okay? There's, not, there's nothing to fear about this. Just choose one that looks good. If you're Christian, find a Christian one. If, you, if you're not Christian, if you, if you have some other, you like Ron Paul's is not Christian. Ron Paul's curriculum is focused on um, he's a, he's liberty, right? Freedom. He's American. So it's very American curriculum that, um, you know, his thing, his curriculum is focused on uh, the kind of tr the traditions of America and... Uh, the kind of the founding of America, the Constitution, that each uh, individual is a free citizen, you know, this idea of self-reliance and independence, these old traditional American values. That's what Ron Paul's curriculum focuses on. It's great for Americans. Now, if you're not American, <laughs> you probably aren't if you're listening to me, um, then uh, maybe it's not the best one for you. But there are many, 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 many others. So this is the point. So just choose something that looks good, try it, and uh, read some reviews, do some research about, you know, homeschool curriculum, and uh, just try some. That's all you need to do. You'll find some things that work. You'll figure it out. As you do it, you, you cha make some changes, and you'll figure it out. You'll get better and better. Oh, this is kind of cool. Vijaya says, um, I don't have grandparents or, or parents alive. I sometimes go to old folks' homes to meet older people and to share their loneliness. Interview them. Also a cool project. Okay, they're not your family, but still you could interview them. Uh, I'm sure they would love it, you know, and put together their stories, all these stories of these older generations. It would be fantastic. Also... Uh, as you start your own family, Vijaya, I don't know if you have kids or not, but if uh, you can tell your own story and, you you know, hopefully you, I don't know when your parents died, but um, if they, you know, if, if you have memories of them, then you can tell stories about your parents and record them so that your kids will, they never met your parents, right? They won't know their grandparents, but they can at least... Um, they can at least, uh, you know, hear your stories about them. And of course... Your, your spouse, hopefully, maybe their parents are alive, so you can interview your spouse's parents as well. So you can still do this for your kids uh, with your own life at least, right? Yeah, this is kind of cool, too. You can get, like Jamal says, several papers 
left by my grandparents contained important information about their lives, what was going on in those times. Yeah, it's really cool. So you can maybe sometimes find old pictures, uh, old letters, papers, things like that. Those are great to collect too. And maybe you can uh, organize them and ed edit them, put them all together, you know, create this family history book for your family. Give it to your children. <laughs> Wynn seems to be an Aristotle fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, Merrick, good point. In the past, we could learn from our parents and grandparents. But unfortunately, nowadays, kids don't speak with their parents. The main source of knowledge is the omnipresent Internet. Well, that's the parents' fault. It's not the kids' fault. It's the parents' fault. This is, this is my point. This is what I'm saying. Okay why are the parents letting them do that right this is what happens with parents so many parents they the kids become teenagers and suddenly the parents are complaining oh they just use the internet oh they don't listen to me oh they don't care well of course not it's too late it's too late you've got to do this from the very beginning homeschool your kids don't let them just play around on the internet. Don't let them play, just play video games all the time. Don't let them watch garbage on TV. Don't let them watch all that garbage in movies. Uh, you know, from the beginning, you, you do this. From the beginning. You can't start when they're, you know, I guess you could try to start when, you're, when they're 16. It, you know, if you, you just will, it's going to be a lot harder <laughs> if they're used to all that stuff and then you decide when they're 16 or they're 15 or they're 14, okay, now we're going to stop all of this. Then you're going to have kind of a big fight on your hands with them. You can still do it. You still probably should do it, but it's going to require a lot more energy and persistence and skill. But if you start when they're two <laughs> and you stay consistent their whole childhood, it's not such a big deal. You've created this culture within your family and you avoid a whole lot of these problems, right? It's, it's better to avoid them than to try to correct them after. So, you know, bad communication with your kids, well, you got to build that communication from the beginning, right? It should be a habit. You should, you should be talking to your kids and have that great communication with them from the beginning and then never let it break. That's how you avoid that. <laughs> Listening to my children making noise right now. I think we're about finished. All righty. Well, let's see. Yeah, okay, I'll finish with this one. Sergeant Sarge says, uh, I'm not a parent myself, but there's some separation between people with all this technology. Exactly. It's not just kids and parents. It's a general problem. Whenever I try to connect with people like my cousins, I get weird eyes. It's quite sad. Right. So that's why, you know, Phones off, no screens. This is a good rule to have in your family with your kids, uh, with everybody. No screens it means no smartphones, no internet, no iPads, no TVs, none of it. Get rid of it all. Get rid of all that stuff. Or have very, very, very strict rules for the parents using it only when the kids are asleep or something, you know. <laughs> um, that's that's my advice. You got to be strict. You got to be very strict about it. Very, very, very tough. I advise super tough practices with this. All right, guys, I think that's it for today. OK, as always, join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com, EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Uh, have a great day and I will see you next time. Bye for now.